الله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين. My brothers and sisters in Islam, السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. I welcome you all in the beginning of a new series of classes uh, which will start in this session بإذن الله تعالى. And this is discussing the chapter of Al-Tahara from the books of Fiqh. We have finished uh, a series of classes in the Tahara, another type of purification. Uh, the purification of the heart, the purification of the nafs. So we spoke about that at length, and we can never say that we give that topic justice. This is the mission of our lives. It should take uh, much more details, much more discussion, and much more uh, reflection uh, to master that area. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us the, our whole lifetime to perfect our spiritual tahara, which is the tazkiyah. However, today we are going to speak about another aspect of tahara, which is also critical and important. In the tazkiyah aspect, in the spiritual development, we make sure that we only worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we only intend to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we make him the object of our worship. However, having done that, we also need to know how to worship him. And we need to know how to make sure that we don't, we stay away from innovations. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala only accepts to be worshipped by what he legislated. So it doesn't matter how sincere you are in your intention and in your seeking of his pleasure, if what you are offering by way of worship is not according to the prescription of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, according to his sharia, it will be rejected. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said in the hadith, Man amila amalan laysa alayhi amuna fahwarat. Whoever does any form of worship without that isn't within our legislation, then it will be rejected. So therefore, we really need to make sure that we study fiqh, to make sure that we understand what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to worship him with. So we begin by studying the chapter of Tahara. Uh, but before I begin, I remind you, and I remind, remind myself of the critical hadith uh, where the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, مَنْ يُرِدِ اللَّهُ بِهِ خَيْرًا يُفَقِّهُ فِي الدِّينِ if Allah wills good for a person, then a sign of that will be that he will open door, he will open doors for him to seek Islamic knowledge. So basically, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has realized that there is goodness in you, and you are sincere, and you're trying your best, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala somehow will open doors for you to seek Islamic knowledge. Right? So this is one of the signs. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves once has, has good plans for you due to your intention due to your intention Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will open doors for you and in the other hadith the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said also مَنْ سَلَكَ طَرِيقًا يَلْتَمِسُ فِيهِ عِلْمًا سَهَّلَ اللَّهُ لَهُ بِهِ طَرِيقًا إِلَى الْجَنَّةِ whoever seeks a path in which he seeks Islamic knowledge whoever endeavors or embarks in a path in which he seeks Islamic knowledge Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will facilitate for him through that path a path in which he will he will find his way to them. Okay? So again, that this is the, the, the one aspect of the hadith. The other aspect is if you are not in a path of seeking Islamic knowledge, this means that you are not in the path towards Jannah. So seeking Islamic knowledge is very critical. And as far as the virtue of seeking Islamic knowledge, it is sufficient for us to know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, told us through the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that the virtue or the excellence of those who seek Islamic knowledge, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, فَضْلُ الْعَالِمِ عَلَى الْعَابِدِ كَفَضْلِي عَلَى أَدْنَاكُمْ The virtue or the excellence of a scholar is compared to a, a, a layman or a worshiper that doesn't have knowledge is like the virtue between the Prophet ﷺ and the least of you. 
Look at the difference between the station of the Prophet وسلم, and the least amongst the Ummah of Muhammad وسلم. The Prophet وسلم, he says the difference between somebody who is a scholar in Islam and somebody who isn't is like the difference between the Prophet وسلم, and the least of the Ummah. Okay? And the good news as well, that whilst you are in the path of seeking Islamic knowledge, you will be entitled for the same virtue. So you don't have to be a scholar to receive the reward of a scholar. As long as you are in the path of becoming a scholar, as long as you are seeking Islamic knowledge, Allah will give you the same reward, the same virtue. The Prophet ﷺ said in the hadith that even the fish in the sea and the ants in their territories, they make istighfar, they seek forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to the person that teaches others good, teaches others Islamic knowledge. Look at subhanAllah, you are engaged in seeking Islamic knowledge, conveying Islamic knowledge, and there are millions of creatures out there in the sea and in the land doing istighfar for you. Creatures that, that never sinned, they will be making istighfar for you. Again, that reward is for the person that is conveying Islamic knowledge, but also for the person that is what? Seeking Islamic knowledge. So the same virtue and the same reward Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given it to both a scholar and that person who is on his way to becoming a scholar. Right? When the people, when uh, in, in the area of fiqh, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Man bi khayl wa fi din. Whoever Allah wills good to, he will give him fiqh in the deen. Fiqh. Anybody can tell us what fiqh means? The word fiqh. You can take a guess. Understanding. Understanding, yeah? And more precisely, deep understanding. Right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran that everything within the heavens and within the earth, they glorify the Lord. Everything is making tasbih to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? But you may not have deep understanding or clear understanding as how they are glorifying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You can see, for example, uh, that they are pointing at the glory of Allah. You know, the magnificence of the, of the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the perfection of the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, all that points to it. All that points to the glory of Allah, to the perfection of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But they also do tasbih. But that tasbih is something that we cannot have an understanding how we do it. Right? Uh, so fiqh, my brothers and sisters in Islam, is developing a deep understanding in the religion. This is the, the general understanding of the word fiqh. However, within, within the area of fiqh, within the area of practical implementations of the deen, practical things like salat, tahara, zakat, sawm, hajj, trading, selling, and, and, and buying, uh, borrowing, uh, divorcing, marrying, uh, and so on and so forth. These practical aspects are called fiqh. So by convention, the ulama in that area of Islamic knowledge, they have adopted this word fiqh to this area of knowledge. Right? So basically, when we speak about tawheed, they will not call that fiqh. They will call this the area of tawheed and aqidah. Monotheism and creed. This is one area of knowledge. Right? Another area of knowledge is, for example, seerah. Understanding the lifetimes of the Prophet وسلم, and so on and so forth. Another area of knowledge is hadith. Another area of knowledge is fiqh. So these are different areas of knowledge. However, we understood that the word fiqh means comprehensive knowledge of the deen. Every aspect of the deen. But within our field, of practical, uh, practical applications of the deen, fiqh means the practical aspects of the religion. So when we have Kitab al-Tahara, the chapter of Tahara, it's very important to begin by the chapter of Tahara. Anybody can tell us why? Why do we begin studying fiqh from the chapter of Tahara? You can take a guess. You don't have to be... Why yeah, why not the chapter of fasting, for example? 
In general, when the ulama, they look at the area of fiqh, they split fiqh into two halves. One half, they call it al-ibadat, and the other half, they call it al-mu'amalat. Al-ibadat means the acts of worship. Salat, zakat, hajj, and siyam. In the other hand, we have the area of mu'amalat, which is dealings between people. So two equal parts of fiqh. Worship and dealings and transactions. So ibadat and mu'amalat. Now when we have to choose between the two, who is more, which, which, which of the two is more important? The ibadat, yes? Ibadat is more important than mu'amalat. Why? Because Allah subhanahu wa says, وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ I have only created mankind, man, mankind and jinn kind for worship. So because of that, they started with the area of uh, ibadat first. And then within the ibadat, we have so many acts of worship. Right? They fall under the five pillars of Islam. So we have salat, we have saum, we have hajj, we have zakat, we have jihad, and other areas. Now, why would we bring the chapter, or which, which of, the, of these chapters will be more important? Salat. Salat. Because the Prophet ﷺ said in the hadith, أَوَّلُ مَا يُسْأَلُ عَنْهُ الْعَبْدِ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ الصَّلَاةِ The first that the servant will be asked for on the day of judgment will be salat. فَإِذَا صَلَحَتْ صَلُحَ الْعَمَلُ كُلُّهُ وَإِذَا فَسَدَتْ فَسَدَ الْعَمَلُ كُلُّهُ If the salat is good and sound, then all his deeds will be good and sound. If his salat is corrupt, then all his following deeds will also be corrupt. So salat has an impact on all other acts of worship. Because of that, it's appropriate to start with a salat. Also, salat is the only pillar in Islam that is an obligation to every single person. When we speak about hajj, there are people who are not obliged to perform hajj. Right? If they are poor or if they are unwell, or unable to, to perform because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says it's, it's a duty towards Allah from people that they will perform hajj for those who are able to do so right? zakat do we all have to give zakat? no no sometimes people are just too poor they don't have money to give zakat so the fiqh of zakat is not a priority it doesn't apply to all when it comes to fasting Again, there are people who would not fast at all. Would that be the case? Yeah. Example? Huh? Some, somebody who is chronically ill. Right? Or somebody, somebody who has a sickness that is not likely to recover from. Right? So somebody, somebody in that state is not going to perform the song, the, song, the fasting today, not tomorrow, not until the end of their lives. Somebody who is too old to perform fasting. Right? He is not going to perform fast. They have to give a ransom or fidya instead of that. So there are people who will fast and there are people who will not fast. But when it comes to salat, is there anyone who can be excused to perform salat? No. no. Everybody has to perform salat. Right? Whenever the time for salat comes, everybody is, obli is obliged to perform salat and they have no excuse. Even if they are fighting in the cause of Allah, mujahid, on the battle of their mounts and their horses, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded them to offer salat as they are, the way they are. On top of the horse, whether they are facing the qibla or not, they have to perform salat. A sick person, is he excused not to pray? No, no one is excused not to pray. You know, If you are able to stand, you stand. If you are not able to stand, you pray seated. If you're not able to pray seated, you lie down. If you cannot even move anything, you move your eye li uh, uh, eyelids. Right? You, you nod your head. If you cannot move anything, you pray with your mind, with your intention. 
But there is no excuse. No one is allowed to allow prayer time to pass without performing salat. And because of that, salat is the one thing that applies to all, and therefore we should start with salat. Right? Also, the Prophet وسلم, said, Tahuru miftah salat. Tahur, being in a, in a state of purity, that is the key to salat. So you cannot start salat unless you are in a state of purity. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam also said, لا صلاة لمن لا طهور له There is no salat for him who have no tahur, who is not in a state of purity. So before having acknowledged that salat is the most important thing, before we study salat, let's start the prerequisite for salat, which is tahara. And that is what we are studying in this series of classes. Right? So tahara, what does it mean? Tahara is a word anybody can contribute with us. What tahara means? Yeah. Linguistically, tahara means being in a state of cleansiness or being, being clean. That is tahara, being clean. Being in a state in which one is clean. That is tahara. From a, a, a shari point of view, from a shari point of view in Islam or in the area of fiqh, the ulama, when they defined tahara, they said, irtifa'u al-hadathi wa zawaru al-khabat. Al-tahara, raf'u al-hadathi wa zawaru al-khabat. Now write it down in English. Let's see how we word it. Because the ulama, they made a big deal out of how they word this. Raf'u al-hadath means the lifting of the state of hadath. Hadath means spiritual impurity. When a person is impure spiritually. Yeah? So, رَفْعُ الْحَدَثِ The removal or the lifting of hadath. وَزَوَالُ الْخَبَثِ And the removing or the, the removal of impurities, physical impurities. One more time. They said, الطَّهَارَ has two parts in its definition. رفع الحدث وزوال الخبث. رفع الحدث means the lifting of the spiritual impurity. The other part of the definition is the, remove, the, the, the removal of the physical impurities. Now I want you to reflect on that definition and tell me what do you notice about it. Concerning the spiritual impurities, we said the lifting, right? When it comes to the physical impurities, we said the removal. Right? Can, can you sense any difference between the two words? Spiritual impurities, for example, like a person who hasn't got wudu. Somebody who broke their wudu, they are spiritually, they are in a state of hadath, which is, and, and know the, the word hadath. Hadath means being in a state of spiritual impurity. So somebody who is not in a state of wudu, they are in a state of hadath. And because they, are, they have hadath, they are spiritually impure. Now that state of spiritual impurity, is it usually lifted by the person or can it go by itself? The person himself has to actually lift that by doing what? By taking wudu or taking ghusl. So you have to actively become involved in that. But when it comes to physical impurities, for example, um, if a form of impurity, urine, for example, there's, there's a drop of urine or an amount of urine that's dropped in your clothes. Now, you didn't actively wash that part of your clothes. Rain came, for example. You were walking in the rain, rain came down, and it went by itself without you being involved. Is that acceptable or not? Is it acceptable as far as tahara is concerned? Yeah. Huh? It is acceptable. And that's why they said the removal, not the removing, 
because it doesn't have to be done by you. As long as it's removed, whether by the person himself or by any, act, any external factors, then it's perfectly acceptable. Sometimes certain impurities under the sun, they will evaporate, for example. Uh, urine of some animals, uh, after some time, they call it in fiqh. You know, when they last for long in a piece of land, and then the sun hits it for a prolonged period of time, and then the wind blows as well, that's it. That itself becomes pure. So that's why now we, 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 we understood from the definition that when it comes to physical impurities, it doesn't matter how it goes, as long as it just goes. Right? And we'll find that out later, inshallah, when we discuss how to remove impurities. Right? But this is something that you can immediately notice from the definition. Right? And that also will involve later on when we, when we study, when one needs to relieve themselves and answer the call of nature, would it be sufficient for them to clean themselves, for example, with tissues? Is that acceptable? Or it has to be water? Huh? It doesn't have to be water? No, because... See, that, that, this is where this definition is, is relevant. Because even if you don't use water, but that impure substance has been removed, then physical impurities have been, have, have been removed. It doesn't matter how you remove it. But when it comes to wudu, for example, wudu, can you have the option of taking wudu with, for example, um, coke? Can you do that? No. no. Tea? Can you take wudu with tea? No. Why? Because it has to be with water. Allah stated it has to be with water. But when it comes to the removing of impurities, it doesn't matter. As long as you are, as long as you are eventually pure from those impurities, then it's acceptable from a standing point of view. Right? So this is something that we quickly learned just from the definition. So again, tahara being a state of purity, has two, two, two segments in its definition. They say irtifa'u al-hadath or raf'u al-hadath raf'u al-hadath which means the lifting of the state of spiritual impurity. Remember the word hadath means what? Being in a state of spiritual impurity. For example, a person who um, broke wind they are in a state of spiritual impurity. A person who slept they right, are instead of spiritual impurity. This, uh, a person who had a wet dream, for example, they are instead of uh, spiritual impurity. So they have to actively lift that up by performing either wudu or ghusl, depending on what, what form of hadath they have. So we have the minor hadath, which requires only wudu, and we have the major hadath, which, which requires what? Ghusl. Right? Brothers, this is, this is a very relaxed discussion, so please feel free to stop me at any point. Right? So now we understood the definition of tahara, and I just took a second now to elaborate a little bit on hadath. What hadath means? Right? I would spell it in English H-A-D-A-T-H. -A -A That's hadath. Right? So we can have the straight definition of hadath, is spiritual uh, being in a state of spiritual impurity, and we can have two forms of hadith. We have the minor hadith, which can be lifted by wudu, and we have the major hadith, which can only be lifted by ghusl. Okay. My advice to you to write down because there will be a lot of information. If you will not be able to remember everything. Trust me. Right, and this is critical. You may not have a chance later on in life to have an intensive course to perform to understand uh, the chapter of Tahara. So please do take notes. This uh, this class is recorded. It will be online, inshallah. But it will be helpful if you can take notes because it will engage your mind as well with it. Right? So now, alhamdulillah, we understand what Tahara is, at least from a definition point of view. We said from an Arabic point of view, it means being in a, being clean. Tahara linguistically means being clean. However, from a, uh, an Islamic point of view, or from a lex from a uh, Shari point of view, it is Raf'u al-Hadath, the lifting of the state of uh, spiritual impurity, and the removal, the removal of 
the physical impurity. Al khabath, khabath means physical impurity. Right? For example, like I said, like urine. Right? Urine is a physical impurity. It has to be removed. How it removed? It doesn't matter. Right? This is generally speaking. There will be a little bit more details. Will come later on. So now, because we have two aspects of tahara, because we have two aspects of tahara, the lifting of the spiritual impurity and the lifting or the removing of uh, physical impurities, these are two subchapters of the chapter of tahara. Is that clear? We have two subchapters of the chapter of tahara. One of them, tahara to hadath, and the other one is tahara to khabar. So when you look at books of fiqh, you will find the scholars, they will decide sometimes to give this one precedence. So they will talk about Rafa al hadath first, the removal of spiritual impurity first. And they will speak about the removing, the removal of physical impurities later on. Rafa al hadath And some other scholars, they will decide to do it the other way around. Right? However, we will begin by Rafa al hadath Lifting of the spiritual impurity. We will begin by that, and once we've discussed it thoroughly, we will move on to Raf al Khabath, or, or the removal of impurities. Now, the first thing that has to be discussed at this stage here is to discuss the means with which one has to lift uh, the, the spiritual impurity. What are we referring to here? How do you lift? the state of hadath. Wudu. Wudu. Right? What do you need to perform wudu? Water. So the first thing we have to discuss now is water and the types of water according to the scholars of Islam. Know that the scholars of Islam have split water in three categories. Some scholars of Islam, they split water into three categories. Right? One category is uh, at tahur at tahur at tahur is the type of water that is pure in itself and has the capacity of purifying other things. Again, so at tahur is that type of water that is pure in itself and has the capacity of purifying other things. Pure water. In Surah Al-Insan, we read, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَسَقَاهُمْ رَبُّهُمْ شَرَابًا طَهُورًا وَسَقَاهُمْ رَبُّهُمْ شَرَابًا طَهُورًا And their Lord allowed them to drink from a type of water, or a type of drink, that is tahur. Tahur. Ali ibn Abi Talib in the books of Tafsir, Ibn Kathir and others was quoted to have said Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will allow the believers when they have crossed the bridge and they, there will be another place called Al-Qantara in which they will take account of one another if there are ill feelings amongst themselves if they have wronged each other in some ways so the believers first they will cross the bridge which is above the uh, fire of hell As-Sirat and then after that, there will be a small bridge called Al-Qantara. When they have crossed in the, within that Qantara, they will be held to take account of one another. Who slandered who, who lied to who, who hurt who's be, uh, uh, whose feelings, and so on and so forth. And then after that, they will be allowed to head towards Jannah. When they are making their way towards Jannah, before they enter Jannah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will find it befitting that their heart has to be cleansed. Because if they go to Jannah and they still have grudge against one another, even Jannah will be spoiled. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will say, uh, will, they will be instructed to a lake from which they will be told to wash their bodies. And when they wash their bodies, all the fatigue and the tiredness from the land of resurrection and the waiting and the tiring and the sun and the heat and all that, all that tiredness will go away and they will have the freshness of Jannah in them. Just from the drinking from that, or from washing from that lake of water. But they will also be told to drink from it. When they drink from it, whatever hard feelings they have within the, their hearts, all will go away. And subhanAllah, you can see how 
when people have ill feelings towards one another, even Jannah can be spoiled. Let alone this, this, this dunya. Even Jannah, the one, the place where in which every form of pleasure there is in Jannah, if you have ill feelings towards your Muslim brothers and sisters, even that would be spoiled. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decides that they will be drinking from a type of water called what? What is it called? Tahur. Tahur. Why is it, why is it Tahur? Because it's pure in itself and has the capacity to purify others. Right? So they will be drinking that and when they drink it, they will forget all the malice, the spite, the animosity they had amongst them, among themselves and then only then they will be allowed to enter Jannah. So the, the first category, the first class of water is uh, At-Tahur. The second class of water is At-Tahir. At-Tahir. At-Tahir, yes. Um, see the ayah in the last um, At-Tahur, why ayah was it? From Surah Al-Insan. وَسَقَاهُمْ رَبُّهُمْ شَرَابًا طَهُورًا I don't recall the, yeah, the, the, the number of the verse. طيب. Uh, Brother Hassan will help us with it in a minute. So the, the second class of uh, water is that which is called al-tahir. Tahir. Anybody can guess what tahir is? No? Yes, I Yes. Tahir is, is a type of water that is pure in itself, but doesn't have the capacity of purifying others or other things. Right? Uh, and the third class is the impure type of water, which is called in Arabic an najis. So we have tahur, we have tahir, and we have najis. Tahur is that type of water that is clean, that is pure in itself, and has the capacity of purifying others. Tahir is that which is pure in itself, but doesn't have the capacity of purifying others. That's tahir. Right? Uh, and najis is somebody or, or uh, a type of water that is impure in itself. It's impure, so when it, when it comes on you, you have to remove it. Right? So this is according to the ulama, according to some ulama, these are the three categories of water. But when we look into it, we'll find that the strongest opinion that water has only two categories. Okay? So this is one opinion that is not the strongest. The strongest is, right, and this is something I would like you to exercise as well. Get yourself familiar with handling differences of opinion. You know, don't panic when you find that, oh my God, I will not have different, what shall I do? Now get used to, uh, advance yourself. You are not a layman, you are a student of knowledge. You know, a student of knowledge will have the capacity with them, within them to handle difference of opinion and understand which one is the strongest with, with its evidence. Right? Now, when, when they considered the second category, categorization of water, uh, water, they said it has only two categories. It is either tahur or najis. Right? The middle category, that category of water that is uh, tahir, pure in itself, the ulama who classified it like that, they say this is something, a type of water, that has changed in either of the three characteristics either in its smell, or in its color, in its color, or, or in its taste. Yes. But if it changes in one of the three categories, one of the three characteristics, then it becomes tahir. This is what they said. But if it hasn't changed in any of these three characteristics, then it's tahur. Right? If it changes in one of these three characteristics by something that is impure, it becomes najis. So that's how they classified it. A type of water that hasn't changed in terms of its taste, its color, and its smell, what do we call it? Tahur. Tahur. Uh, if it has changed in either of its taste, color, or smell by something that is pure, what, what do they call it? They call it tahir. But if one of the three characteristics has changed by something that is impure, it will be called what? Najis. Najis. Now, when we look at the one, the middle, the middle category, if it changes, if it change, if you put tea, for example, tea is pure, right? It's not filth or uh, impurity. 
If you put it in the water, and then it changes the color of that water. Now, what should we cut? What should we, what should we call that water? Tahir. Some ulama call it tahir, but the ulama, according to the strongest opinion, they say this is no no longer water. What's it called now? Tea. It's tea now. It is not water anymore. So we cannot take tea and, and make it amongst the categories of water when it's not water. Right? If we add vimto to it, do we give it the name water? It's juice. It's not uh, water anymore. So because of that, they say, if water has changed in one of the three characteristics by something that is pure, it will take the name of that thing. It will not, it, it will not remain uh, in the name of uh, water. So the strongest opinion that we have only water that is tahur or najis, no middle way. Is everybody clear about this? Okay. Evidence to this is found in Surah Al Furqan, verse 47. Surah Al Furqan, verse 47. For the purpose of this class, just write the name of the surah and then you can refer back to it later on, inshallah. Yes. Allah, huh? Surah Al Furqan, verse 47. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَأَنزَلْنَا مِنَ السَّمَاءِ مَا أَنْطَهُورَ And we have brought down from the heaven ma water, that is tahur. What does that tell us? That the water, of uh, the rain water, is something that you can use to lift the state of hadath from you, the spiritual impurity. So the rain water is good enough. Right? And if the water is changed in, in taste or in color or in uh, smell, but not in significant way, in such a way that it is so subtle, it is so small change, that we still call it water. That is still called what? Tahur. Tahur. Because when rain comes down from the heaven, they go into uh, wells and they go into streams, and usually they get affected by the surrounding. You know, they, they have some uh, green color to it, sometimes they get mixed with the mud, and they have brown color to it. Uh, sometimes the smell of the fruits or, or the leaves, some, some form of change will, will occur to it, but it is so subtle that it, it, has, it has not shifted from the name water. As long as that's the case, we still can use that type of water. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala called the rain that comes from heaven, called it ma'an tahura. Yes, Sahih. Sure, you know the water is coming in most of the places that you cite them. So for example, the water that you use is basically two processes in three cycles. Yeah. Again, we ask ourselves the simple question. The three characteristics of water. Smell, color, and taste. If they have not changed, the product, the final product of whatever being processed, if it hasn't changed, then it is usable. That's fine. Whether it has been processed or natural or something, this is what we're looking for, these three characteristics. Yeah? And this discussion is important, my brothers and sisters, because why would it be important for you to learn this difference? Because later on, you will realize that you, you, are, you, you are required to take wudu with water. And in the absence of water, you, you should be using what? Dust. dust. You know? Stones or dust, anything from the soil. Right? Now, if you don't have water, right, but you have um, flavored water, flavored water, you know that, 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 uh, that, that sometimes they have this, uh, uh, yeah, like Evian or uh, whatever other uh, brands they have. They have a strawberry flavor or lemon. Uh, now, if you have that, can you still say, I don't have water, and take wudu? Or you can say, no, this is not water, because one of the three characteristics has changed. And therefore, it is not water anymore. Because what changed? The taste. The taste has changed. So that is not called water. And in that situation, only in that situation, you can uh, resort to dust. Mm -hmm. right? You can do do the table. Yes, Would you, you define seawater as water because that, that has taste? That's Say that again. Seawater. Sea seawater. The Prophet was asked about this specifically, and then he said you can take wudu with it. Okay. It's a good question because the taste of the seawater has changed with the salt, and the Prophet he was asked, uh, 
قال هو الطهور ماؤه الحل ميته. The Prophet was asked about the water of the sea and he said هو الطهور ماؤه. The water of the sea is طهور. طيب. Uh, meaning that it is clean in itself and it has the capacity of purifying others. Al-Hillu Maytatuh is, is a place where if you find something dead there, you still can eat it. Unlike in the land, if something is dead, you cannot eat it. You have to uh, slaughter it in an Islamic way. In the Sunnah also, we find the Prophet ﷺ, he says, there is a hadith that is not strong, but this is the hadith that, that was that based, that helped the scholars of Islam to bring these characteristics. The Prophet ﷺ said, or was quoted to have said, الماء طهور لا ينجسه شيء إلا ما غلب على لونه أو طعمه أو ريحه. طيب. The Prophet says, ما water is pure and has the capacity of purifying, purifying others. And look, Subhanallah, look at how in Arabic language uh, to, to describe something as being pure and has the capacity of purifying others, there's only one word that can that is needed. In English, you have to use like six words. <laughs> Something pure and has the capacity of purifying others. In Arabic, tahur is sufficient. So the Prophet Sallallahu says, Alma, water is tahur. La yunjisu shay, nothing can make it uh, impure except that which uh, takes over its color or its taste or its smell. Right? Although this hadith isn't strong in terms of the uh, chain of narrators, but it's one of those hadith that fitted very well with the analysis of the scholars. Okay. So, when will the water become impure? When the one of these change. Huh? One of these. When will the color become impure? If one of the three things have changed. Okay. So, if we assume in a situation that there is a, a, a puddle of water, or a tub, for example, and uh, a drop of urine has dropped in that water. Has it become impure? Huh? Depends what the volume of water is. It depends whether any of the three characteristics have changed or not. If eventually none of these three have changed, then that water is pure. So merely, simply the fact that a drop of urine dropped in that water, uh, it doesn't uh, make it impure immediately. We'll have to ask the question. Has any of the three characteristics changed? If, if the answer is yes, then it becomes nejis. If the answer is no, it remains pure. Pure that you can use to purify yourself with. Yes, Akhi? How do you reconcile between the drop of water and the drop of urine getting in the water? Uh, since in your clothes, I'm not sure if there is. In your clothes? In your clothes, yeah. Once Okay, we say that now what we're discussing is Taharatul Hadath. Tahara al Khadath is the second chapter of uh, the chapter of Tahara. So we have the chapter of Tahara. The first chapter, the first sub chapter is uh, the lifting of the Hadath, the spiritual impurity. The lifting of the physical impurity will be discussed at, at a later time, inshallah. But for now, let's focus on this. There is a hadith also where the Prophet وسلم, said, uh, إذا كان الماء قلتين لم يحمل الخبر. If water exceeds a certain volume, two قلة in the in the time of Salam, two containers basically. If it exceeds that, it will not carry impurity, meaning it will not be affected by the impurity it carries. So sometimes you have a lot of a, a huge amount of water, like the sea, like the sea. You know, we can all assume that there's a lot of impurities dropping in the sea, yeah. like birds droppings and whatever. But because of the huge amount of the sea, it doesn't get affected. Right? So what really matters at the end of the day is whether one of the three traits of the water has changed or not. Um, one question here, how do we uh, purify the water when it becomes impure? Right? Ibn Uthaymin was asked this question and he says, right? If we are able to remove the effect of that impurity 
from the water in terms of the taste, the color, or the smell, then the removal of that will become purification of the water. So at the end of the process, it will be called tahor. Either by adding too much water. You know, sometimes you have a small amount of water, and you add so much water to it that it will take over the little impurity. What's, what's, what's the situation here? The water becomes tahor. Yeah? Uh, or by chemical processing. If you are able to chem chemically process it, that's also acceptable. Uh, if the najasa itself has a body, if it's like a solid najasa, the removing the body of the, the, the najasa, that is also required. طيب, you have an amount of water, inshallah, and with this we'll, we'll conclude the first half of the session. You, you, you come across uh, an amount of water right, in front of you, and you examine it, and you can't tell for sure whether the three traits or the three characteristics have, have changed or not. So you are in doubt. Is it pure or is it impure? What do you do? Pure. Huh? Pure. You, you assume it's pure and you, you, go, you go ahead with it? Okay. Huh? Let's say, for example, you have seen um, some urine go into the water, but you're not 100% sure whether it has changed the color, the smell, or uh, the taste. You're not 100% sure. So you are in a state of doubt. What should you do with that water? Should you use it or go to the soil and the sand and the dust or whatever? So if you are in doubt, what do you do? You leave it. Yeah? You just leave it and go to the soil. You assume the original state of things. The original state of everything is pure. Everything is pure until proven otherwise. So if something was pure and then a drop of urine dropped there, and then you're not sure whether it has changed the taste or, uh, or the smell or the color. In that case, you revert back to the original state. And the original state is what? The purity of the water. Right? There's a rule in Islam that is very helpful. And you, you will benefit from it not only in the chapter of Tahara, in many other areas uh, within the Islamic fiqh. al yaqeen la yazuru bishak. This qaida. Certainty cannot be nullified except with another certainty. Or certainty cannot be nullified by doubt. Right? And this is very handy. Let, let's, let me give you an example. You took wudu in the morning. Right? And you, you remember clearly taking wudu. You were in a state of wudu. And then you walk to the masjid and then before you entered the masjid, you were in doubt whether you broke wind or not. So you initially you were in a state of certainty about what? About taking wudu. You know for sure you took wudu, right? But then doubt came concerning uh, the breaking of wind, right? So now that doubt, can it nullify the certainty? No, no you can ignore the doubt. And you assume what you know is certain, right? Let's give another example. Say, for example, in the morning, you left home and you remember clearly that you did not take wudu. You remember clearly going to the toilet and then rushing out to the door. Right? So you know for sure that you, you didn't have wudu. So that the lack of wudu was a certainty. But then whether, whether or not you took wudu when you came into university or not, that is something you're not 100% about. You are doubtful about it. So what should you assume? Huh? You assume that you don't have wudu. Right? This qaida is very important. Right? Certainty can only be nullified by certainty. The same thing with water. If you know an amount of water was pure at some point, and then some, something happened to it, and then you're not sure whether it has changed or not, then you assume the original state. The other way around, if you have an amount of water that you know is, is uh, impure, Right? That's certainty. But it was processed. But then you're not 100% sure that that processing was sufficient. Right? Or for example, you added water, a lot of other water to it. And then you're not sure whether, whether the, it has taken over the smell 
of the impurity and the color or whatever. Right? Now that's doubt. So what should you assume? You should assume the certainty, which is that water remains on the original state, which you are not, which you know of, which is it is impure, and therefore you should look for another amount of water. Uh, and where, when, where do we find this qaida in the in the hadith? And like I said to you, this this qaida you will see it will come across with us a lot in many other situations. The Prophet sallallahu was once asked by a man. He complained to the Prophet sallallahu and he said, Ya Rasulullah, inna rajula yajidu shay'a fi batnihi. فهل ينصرف من صلاته؟ He said one will be in the salat and he will feel rumbling sounds within his uh, stomach and he will not be sure whether something has broken out or not, wind or whatever. Uh, the Prophet ﷺ said, he says, لا ينصرف حتى يسمع صوتا أو يجد ريحا. He should not leave the, the masjid or he should not leave the salat until he smells something or, uh, or hears something, right? Mm-hmm. Until he smells something or he hears something. What is that? When you smell something or hear it, that becomes what? Certainty, right? So the Prophet, uh, the Prophet is saying that this man took wudu and started the salat. He is certain that he had wudu. And now he is doubtful whether something has come out of him or not. Now that is doubt. The Prophet said, he said you should not leave the salat. You should remain in the salat until you are certain that something was smelled or something was heard. Other than that, you should not leave the salat. This is a golden rule in Islam. And many people who have wiswas, if they apply this rule, their life will become easy. Right? Their life will become very easy. All you have to do is follow certainty. And doubt that comes after the certainty will have no weight or no value. Okay, we'll stop here with the la that is sufficient unless you have any questions before we conclude. Yes, Sahih. Um, when you are certain that you had to do, um, you thought you did your certain, and then let's say, Dover, for now, after you start to make sure you remember that you weren't certain, you were certain you didn't have to do mm-hmm. You have to, like, you missed obviously two to last, you have to go play that again. Okay, that's a very good question, brothers and sisters. Pay attention to this. Let's assume that you thought that you have wudu. You thought you have wudu, and then you performed a certain salat. And then later on, you remembered with certainty that you actually didn't have wudu. Because you remember that during the break, you went to the toilet and, and came out, so your wudu from the morning was, was broken. So now, what happens to that salat? No, huh? You have to do it again. Right? You are not going to be sinful for praying salat without wudu, without the state of salat. This is, this is a sinful act, usually, it's a sinful act. But because you did it out of forgetfulness or out of confusion, Allah will not uh, uh, hold you accountable for it, but you will be required to repeat the salat. Now let me ask you another question. Right? Let's say you have two trousers. One trouser in the morning, you, were wearing, uh, you had one trouser that has impurities in it, and the other trouser was clean. Right? So you, you, you knew which one is which. But then in the morning, in the rush, you took the one that was impure, that has some droppings of urine or whatever. And you took it out, and then you took wudu, and you prayed duha with it. And then prayed asr. And then you came back home. What is the ruling of that salat? Salat al duha and salat al-asr. Huh? So now we have a state of hadath or khabath here? Khabath. You have khabath, right? Yeah. What will be the ruling now? Well, the salat, the, the ruling of salat al dhuhr and salat al asr. This is not accepted. It's actually valid. It's actually valid. And that is one of the critical differences between hadath and khabath. Yeah. Right? Uh, the removal of hadath is a must. Without it, the salat is invalid. And uh, if you don't have it, if you don't have wudu, out of forgetfulness, right, you will not be sinning, but your salat is uncountable. You have to repeat it. But in the state of khabath, you are required to remove the khabath. But if out of forgetfulness, you started the salat, or and you finished it, or you performed half of it, or a portion of it, with something of impurity on you, then your salat is acceptable. You don't have to repeat it. Huh? Because you forget. 
No, we, we, you forgot. In, in both cases, you forgot. You forgot your wudu, and we said you have to repeat the salat. And you forgot that your trouser had impurities, but we didn't ask you to repeat the salat. This is a very important difference between the hadith and khabar. Right? The evidence to this is found in the, in the authentic hadith where the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa led the jama'ah uh, in salat. And you know that in the time of the Prophet ﷺ, they didn't have any carpets in the masjid. So he prayed with his sandals on. And everybody in the masjid, they, they prayed with their sandals on. That was the norm. So it is a sunnah actually to pray with your sandals, provided that you're not in a, uh, in, in a carpeted prayer room or a masjid or something like this. If you're in an open field, it's sunnah to pray with your shoes on. So everybody prayed with their shoes on. Inside of the salat, after a rak'ah or so, uh, the Prophet ﷺ, he removed his shoes. And then all the people in the masjid, they removed their shoes immediately. This is how obedient they were. They weren't waiting for somebody to tell them that you have to remove your shoes. Well, they saw the Prophet ﷺ removing his shoes, and they removed it immediately. So after the prayer, the Prophet ﷺ, when he concluded the salat, he said to them, why did you remove your shoes? They said, Ya Rasulullah, ra'aynaka khala'ta fakhala'ana. Ya Rasulullah, we saw you remove your shoes, so we removed our shoes. Right? So he said, in my case, Jibreel salam came and told me that my shoes had impurities in them. And because of that, I had to remove my shoes. Right? Now, from this hadith, did they repeat the salat? Huh? We have no narrations, we have no report that they had to repeat the salat. Right? And this is something that happens to many people. If the salat was repeated, somebody would have reported that. So the absence of report indicates what? The fact that they, they did not repeat the salat. So this means that portion of the salat which was performed with impurity in the sandals of the Prophet wasallam, was that accepted or not accepted? Accepted. accepted. Because he did it out of uh, forgetfulness or confusion. But the minute you know, you will be required to remove the impurity. If you are in the salat, you, rem you remove the impurity to the best of your ability. Okay, if you remember during the salat. You, you, that's what I'm saying. If yeah, you remember you inside of the salat. Huh? You wear this trouser during the salat, uh, and this trouser is uh, impure. Yeah, if you remember inside of the salat, if it's something that you can remove, for example, if it's like a jacket, you take it off, that's it. That, that, that will suffice. But if it's something that will reveal your aura, then you have to come out of the salat, uh, remove the impurity, and then come back to the salat properly. You are not allowed to perform with any form of filth or impurity on you, on your body, or in your clothes, or in your spot of salat, in your sajada or in your, in, in your prayer mat. Right? You, are, you, are, you are obliged, it's an obligation for you to remove it. Right? You are allowed to do that only out of forgetfulness. You will be forgiven out of forgetfulness. But the minute you know, you will be obliged to not pray unless you have removed uh, those substances. وصلوا فيها بإذن الله تعالى جزاكم الله خير سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك نشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت نستغفرك ونتوب إليك الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين. We return back after the break and we will have to endure a little bit because we are hoping to finish the chapter of طهارة within the coming six or seven sessions. So they will have to be a little bit long in order, to, in order for us to finish the whole chapter of Tahara. So bear with us, inshallah. Uh, one remaining uh, aspect of the previous discussion, we discussed uh, the types of water, uh, the availability of water. You know? If one says, I, there, there is no water that is Tahur available to me freely, right? But in the shop there is pure water. There is water that is tahor. Now, can, can this person resort to tayammum or he or she will have to pay and buy the pure water from the shop? Now, if you don't understand the question, put your hands up, please. Okay. A person is about to pray salat and they need to take wudu. And we said the means for taking wudu is water. And it has to be tahur. But when he, when he looks around, he doesn't find any tahur water free, freely available. So the only tahur water that's available for this person 
is water that he has to purchase, has to buy and pay money for. Now, is he obliged to pay money and get that water? Or he can just say that I don't have it freely available, so I'm going to resort to dust, stones, and the like. Huh? If you think he has to pay, put your hands up. If you can afford it, you can afford it. He can afford it, yes. He's got money in his pocket. Taib? All right, that's the correct answer. Taib? There's another rule that I'm going to teach you now, inshallah. Uh, the answer to this question is, he has to pay and buy the water that is tahur, and he cannot resort to tayammum, tayammum using dry ablution or dust and, and stones, when there is water available, tahur, but he has to pay money for. He needs to pay that amount of money and get that tahur. And the rule for this is, again, it's a, it's a principle of fiqh, uh, like the principle we learned before the Salat, certainty can only be nullified by certainty. Another rule that you will learn today is مَا لَا يَتِمُّ الْوَاجِبُ إِلَّا بِهِ فَهُوَ وَاجِبُ مَا لَا يَتِمُّ الْوَاجِبُ إِلَّا بِهِ فَهُوَ وَاجِبُ That which is required for the fulfillment of an obligation is in itself an obligation. Yeah? One more time. That which is required for the fulfillment of an obligation is in itself an obligation. So now, the purchase of the money, is that an obligation or not? It becomes an obligation because it is needed for the fulfillment of the obligation, which is using water for wudu. And that qa'idah as well, this principle of fiqh will come again later on as well. So as we, as we go along, we will learn certain issues but what I find more interesting and more important for you to learn are these qawaid, the principles of fiqh, because they will equip you with general understanding that is transferable. You can apply it to other situations. Now we have finished from the discussion around water. What is the following discussion that is uh, logically required after the discussion of water? Can anybody help us? Yeah. Having discussed water, what will be the second thing that is needed to be discussed in order to fulfill the spiritual state of tahara? How to, huh? How to. How to perform wudu? Anything comes before that? Ghusl. Ghusl. Anything before that? No, how to purify this. Huh? You know you have water. What do you need for the water? A vessel. A vessel. A container. Okay. So this is called the discussion around Al-Aniya, the containers in which one will have the water. Al-Aniya, Al-Aniya, again in Surah Al-Insan, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, يُطَافُ عَلَيْهِمْ بِآنِيَةٍ مِنْ فِضَّةٍ In Jannah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give the believers the pleasure that uh, wine and different types of drink will be offered to them in aniyah that is made of silver. So, so the word aniyah also occurred in Surah Al-Insan. Al-Aniyah. So aniyah is the container, the mug, the jug, or whatever you want to call it. Uh, with it because water is fluid, and for it to be controlled, it has to be contained, and that has to also be discussed. So the rule here, all types of ania are permissible, right? whether it is made of uh, wood or chinaware or any other type of substances, all of them are permissible, unless we have an exception. And we will be listing the exception. Okay? And this is something else I want you to learn when you discuss fiqh, the ulama. What they would make sure to do, if there is a complex discussion, they will give you the rule. And then they will be telling you, everything is halal except one, two, and three. So the general rule, everything is halal except one, two, and three. Or sometimes maybe the, the, the general rule is haram. Right? For example, having an uh, intimate relationship with the opposite gender. Everything is haram except... Uh, if it's a wife or 
ملك اليمين what your right hand has possessed in battles and in jihad etc طيب so there will be a general rule and then exception so you will learn to speak like this and subhanallah what one thing amazing about fiqh and understanding fiqh you will you will learn how to organize your thoughts how to tackle a complex situation or a complex uh, discussion organize it and then deliver it or uh, address it in an organized fashion in a structured fashion and once subhanallah when you have done a lot of this you will have a problem you will not be as sociable as you were before because people usually when they speak they speak randomly you know they start something and then before concluding one topic they go to another topic and they they, they, they digress here and they digress there and sometimes no conclusion is made at all and you, so you see no system in discussing things uh, so when you have become uh, involved in seeking Islamic knowledge you will be used to the way of thinking of the scholars whereby they think systematically and they talk systematically so be warned you know, you might get to a stage where you can only socialize comfortably and you find fulfillment in discussions if you are with people who are like you, seeking Islamic knowledge. Okay. So now if we see here, uh, in this discussion, we will, we will learn the general rule first. Everything is permissible. A container can be made of anything. It is halal. That's the general rule. Where do we find this rule? In Surah Al-Baqarah, verse 29. Verse 29 of Surah Al-Baqarah, that's chapter 2. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, uh, at the beginning of that verse, هُوَ الَّذِي خَلَقَ لَكُمْ مَا فِي الْأَرْضِ جَمِيعًا He is the one who created for you everything that is on the surface of this earth. Or on this earth. He is the one who created for you everything that is on this earth. So, this is a general rule that everything within this earth is free for us to use in whichever way we want. Right? So that's the general rule. And then after that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make certain things haram. I say this is haram, that is haram, that is haram. So now let, let's see what else is impermissible. Anything that is made of gold or silver. This is something that you cannot use to take wudu, and in general, you cannot use it uh, for drinking as well, uh, or, or eating as well. The Prophet وسلم, in the hadith recorded by Bukhari and Muslim, narrated by Hudayfa radiallahu an, the Prophet وسلم, said, لا تشربوا في آنية الذهب والفضة ولا تأكلوا في صحافها. Do not drink from the containers of gold and silver, and do not eat from its plates or plates made of gold and silver. For they are for them, referring to the disbelievers, they are for them in dunya and they are for you or for us in the akhirah. Right? So as believers, we refrain from the use of silver and gold in any uh, containers or uh, plates or uh, any, anything to eat or drink with, because the Prophet ﷺ, he said it will be for you in the Akhirah, so leave that for the Akhirah. So that's the first exception. Any form of container is permissible to use, um, except if it is um, made of gold and silver. Now let me ask you a question. What if a person finds water that is tahur, but out of negligence or forgetfulness uses uh, a container made of silver right? and then takes wudu with that. What is the ruling of his wudu? And if he prayed, what is the ruling of his salat? Before we get to the salat, let's discuss the wudu. Is the wudu valid or invalid? Huh? If he remembers. Yeah. He knows. I know. He, he remembered. Even if he remembered later, okay. what do we tell him? Repeat the salat, repeat the wudu? Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. We say it is impermissible to use the containers of silver and gold, but the wudu per se, the wudu in and of itself is valid. Yeah. Right? The wudu in itself is valid. Right? Because later on, we will discuss what makes a wudu valid. 
and amongst them isn't a list of what containers you use. Right? So it is impermissible for you to um, use containers of silver and gold. But if you do use them and take wudu, as far as wudu is concerned, there are pillars of wudu and there are obligations of wudu. If you fulfill them, then your wudu, your wudu is valid. But you will be sinful for using containers of gold and silver. Does that make sense? So what, what we are saying here that you are not allowed to use containers of uh, gold and silver, but uh, if you do use them, you will be sinful if you, if you do that deliberately, knowingly. Uh, you will be for forgiven if, you, if it's out of ignorance or out of forgetfulness uh, or out of confusion. But your wudu is intact. Your wudu is, for, is, as long as you fulfill the pillars of wudu, which we will learn later on, and the obligations of wudu, as long as you fulfill that, then your wudu is valid. Like, for example, lowering the garment below the ankles. What is the ruling of that? This is impermissible. Right? Now, what is the ruling of somebody who prays and in the Salat, they, they, they have their garments below their ankles? What is the ruling of their Salat? Valid. Huh? Valid, yeah. Because as far as the Salat is concerned, what you have to watch out for are the pillars of Salat, the obligations of the Salat. If you fulfill the, the pillars and the obligations, the salat in itself is fulfilled, is, is acceptable, is valid. Right? But you are sinful for lowering the garment. You are s sinful for lowering the garment. Right? And that's why sometimes you find people, they would um, lift their trousers up and fold them in the salat, thinking that in the salat, uh, if you lower your garment, it will invalidate the salat. It has no effect on the salat, but it's a sinful act, and one should refrain from it. So now, the hadith stated that it is not permissible to eat or drink from awani al dhahab wal fadda containers made of uh, silver and gold. Now what we're talking here is wudu. Uh, how can we conclude from that that wudu as well is not permissible from containers of gold and silver? Even though the hadith explicitly said, uh, don't eat and don't drink. So how, how do we con conclude that? Um, don't drink, this is the not talk. Hmm? So the water will be not talk from the drinkable water mm. from this one. Mm -hmm. I conclude it. Some scholars, they said, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, utiya jawami al kalim. He is the one who has given the aggregate forms of words, which means few words that have many meanings. And whenever a certain word is needed, he will include it. Right? That is Jawami al kalim And the Prophet ﷺ wouldn't have uh, dropped out the word wudu if that is con that's included in the prohibition. So he listed eat and drink, and he did not list wudu. So, if wudu is part of that prohibition, the Prophet would have listed it. Yeah? So some scholars, they said, since it's not listed, uh, then it is not included. So wudu with these containers, using them for any other purposes other than eating and drinking is permissible. Right? Other scholars, they said no. Okay, and this is what I would like you to be familiar with, that people can have, scholars can have different views and different interpretations and different understanding uh, depending on how much knowledge and how much insight Allah has given them. Right? Uh, other scholars, they say, uh, the Prophet wasallam, at times, he would not list everything. He will give you certain things, not by way of exclusive list, but rather as examples. Right? And you should understand that anything that, comes, uh, that is within that uh, range of actions is also included. So when the Prophet ﷺ said, do not eat and drink, like he's also saying, do not eat, drink, do not uh, sleep on them, do not, um, uh, what's the word, or take wudu on them. So these eat and drink are only examples. So, uh, So this is basically an example, not a limitation on what is permissible.
Ibn Uthaymeen rahmatullahi alayhi, of these two opinions, he says, the reality is the first opinion is stronger. The Prophet Ibn Uthaymeen rahmatullahi alayhi, he says that the strongest opinion is the first one. That uh, it will not be included in the prohibition. So what is imp uh, impermissible is only the use for it in drink and, uh, and eating. Uh, sorry, the, the Prophet ﷺ said in the hadith, إِنَّهَا لَكُمْ فِي الدُّنْيَا وَلَهُمْ فِي الْآخِرَةِ They are for you in Akhira and they are for them in dunya. What is he referring to? Huh? The, the gold and silver. So when he said they are for them, they use it in different aspects. And they are for you means that you don't use them at all except in the Akhira. So with that explanation of the hadith when the Prophet ﷺ explained it like that we understand that drinking and eating are only examples of other uses do you see do you see how this is arrived at so the Prophet ﷺ, he says do not eat or drink from containers and plates of gold and silver and the reason being because they are for them for the kuffar for the disbelievers in this life and for us in the hereafter so meaning that in this life we're not using them at all so that explanation at the end of the hadith gives us a point that uh, the strongest opinion that it is impermissible to use it at all, not only for food and drink. Food and drink is listed here as only example. Huh? So, so this is, this is the, the strongest opinion which Ibn Uthaymi rahmatullahi have concluded. Is this point clear? Right? So in basically everything the use of containers of gold and silver is impermissible in all types of uses, whether it is food or drink or wudu or anything else, because they are for the disbelievers in this dunya, and as for the believers, it will be for them in the akhirah. Now, the containers used by the disbelievers, are they uh, permissible for you to use or not? And this, subhanAllah, is a relevant question for us, especially here living in the West, uh, sometimes you can be uh, flat mate with somebody who is a disbeliever, mm. or in a workplace where you have to share certain utensils and uh, containers and whatnot. Uh, so this question is relevant. You know, the, uh, the awani, the ania, or the containers used by the disbelievers, are they permissible or impermissible for us to use? To with, uh, for wudu purposes. Yeah. Is it permissible or not? The reality is, it is halal. We, we, we are allowed to use it. Uh, however, the only thing that we are reminded of, if there is any form of impurity in these containers, all that is required of us is to uh, remove the impurity and use it. It is authentically reported that the Prophet wasallam he borrowed a container from a polytheist lady, a mushrika lady, and he used his contain her container to take wudu with, and the Prophet ﷺ, he also allowed other the Sahaba alayhim, the water gushed from the container in such a way that everybody also managed to take wudu from that one container. Mm -hmm. So that container was, was owned by a disbeliever, a polytheist lady, uh, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave the Prophet ﷺ a miracle, mu'jiza, mm -hmm. whereby water gushed from that container in big amount so that him وسلم, and all the Sahaba uh, Managed to take wudu with it. Ibn Uthaymi rahmatullahi he says, لكن إذا علم أن الكفار يطبخون فيها الخنزير فحينئذ الأصل فيها المنع لأن الأصل فيها النجاسة بقرنة الحال فلا نأكل فيها إلا بعد الغسل والورع ألا نأكل فيها ونحن نجد غيرها ابتعادا عن ملابستهم وملامستهم. Ibn Uthaymi rahmatullahi he says, however, if these containers we're talking about are known for you that they are used for the purpose of cooking impermissible things or impure things like pig or swine, pork or whatever. If they, if they cook for that purpose, then we know that these utensils and these containers are impure. Right? So in that situation, we are only allowed to use it if we have washed it. We wash it, and once it's clean, the fact that it belonged to a kuffar did not matter. The fact that it was used previously to cook 
something that is impure, uh, pork or swine, uh, that did not matter as long as it is now pure. Okay? But Ibn Uthaymin he says, وَالْوَرَعُ الورع. What is الورع? We just studied this recently. الورع <laughs> huh? To leave that which is likely to harm you in the akhirah or which, which could possibly harm you in the akhirah. Stay from anything that could, could, could give you confusion. Okay? So Ibn Uthaymin rahmatullah he says, الورع ألا نأكل فيها ونحن نجد غيرها ابتعادا عن ملابستهم وملامستهم. It's best if we stay away from these containers because if we are using their, their utensils and their containers, it means that we are so intermingling with them to a, a very close proximity. And that would mean that we are likely to be affected by them. And as Muslims, to re refrain, to, to maintain your uh, identity, your Islamic identity, to re maintain your um, set of principles in life and in, in the hereafter, your belief, you are encouraged to intermingle more heavily with Muslims and to intermingle less with people who don't share the same faith as you because people get affected and influenced by who they accompany. You know, they say, As-sahibu, sahib. As-sahib, sahib. Your companion is a puller. He pulls you to wherever they may be. Right? If they are non-practicing, if they are non-Muslims, uh, their, their habits, their habits, their conduct, their etiquette, their belief system, their, all of that will rub off on you eventually. So as a Muslim, to protect your deen, you should not be in that close proximity whereby you can use or you will, you will be in the need to use their utensils and your, their, their containers uh, and the like. But as far as wudu is concerned, using the, that container is permissible and as long as you use it for uh, after cleaning it, basically, if it's known to be impure. I think this is enough for today, inshallah. Uh, I will conclude here, unless you have any questions or you need any elaborations. <clears throat> I think this, this is sufficient. I just remind you that we will be discussing uh, many various topics. I, I made sure that today, inshallah, we only took an hour and a half. But in the following classes, we will be using the entire two hours. Because there is no way we will, fill, we will cover the entire chapter of Tahara in six sessions, unless we make it an intensive six sessions. So bear that in mind, and bear in mind that you will be required to take notes. There will be no PowerPoint presentation. If you don't have handouts, you will be relying on taking notes, inshallah. So bear that in mind. If you could also go through your notes, recap things, um, make your notes properly, and even you can resort back to the recordings. These recordings are online now. So go back and listen to uh, to, to make yourself familiar with whatever we concluded. I remind you that uh, it is very unlikely, you know, given the lifestyle that we live in these days, it's very unlikely that in the near future you will have another opportunity to study the chapter of Dahara again. You know? Usually we take things lightly, saying that, ah, oh, in the future I will come across it again. But trust me, lifestyle here in the West, in London, and being students who are about to graduate, and once you graduate, you have a job, uh, and you have responsibilities, trust me. You, while you are at it, do it once, but do it properly. And make sure you understand it thoroughly, inshallah. And like I said, inshallah, in the following semester, we will begin the chapter of Salat, inshallah. Okay. Jazakumullah khair. Subhanakallah. Alhamdulillah. Ashhadu an la ilaha illa anta. Astaghfirullah.